So if everything goes according to plan, mm -hmm. it should be the first video that has the thing that you did for this channel. What was that again? That'd be fancy. The, uh, well, the little introduction animation I made for you, you mean? Yes, that. <laughs> That's pretty exciting. Welcome, heroes and villains, to Virtue Enterprises' YouTube channel. Take a moment, relax, stop your bickering, and just enjoy the show. As you, ju as the people watching this just saw, the I have a new intro animation for my channel, and Eric here helped uh, made that. Why I say help make it, that? He made it. <laughs> well, I made it. Helps your channel. I think it helps me. Helps you. Helps everybody. It's good. So, how long have you been making animation for? Well, I've been trained, let's say, in doing animations. It's been about a good eight years uh, since I graduated from uh, from Algonquin College. I've done some commercial animations here and there, some small commissions here and there, but. For the most part, it's just been uh, the past eight years. Just been me teaching students how to do, you know, three D models, how to do some animation stuff like that for video games. Uh, in my career as a uh, professor at Algonquin College. So how long? How long did that intro that we just saw take? I'd say roughly five or I'd say like five or eight hours uh, of work, give or take. I didn't really time it personally. I was just having so much fun doing it. I just and I'd wake up and be like, oh, yeah, I got to work on this thing. I got to make a sun. How the heck am I going to make a sun? Oh, yeah, we're going to have this big emissive texture. And I'm going to put like a dark mask around it. So that that's how I that's how you get the, you know, the difference between your brighter oranges and your darker reds. And having fun just figuring out how to do that. I was like, yeah, how am I going to make the mask? I can't do it by hand. It's going to take forever. I'm going to use a program that's going to generate all these differences and in, in, in all these little effects. And stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, I could. Oh. <laughs> I, don't know, I was just having a lot of fun doing it, so. Didn't really bother uh, timing how long it took, but I'd say about five to eight hours. Wouldn't that mean that YouTubers that do animations, that anim YouTubers that, that are basically animation YouTubers, that those take forever? <laughs> Not necessarily. It depends on you know, what they're doing. If they already have the characters modeled ahead of time, uh, making the animation itself, yes, is a lot of work. But, I mean, it doesn't take forever to do, right? As long as you apply yourself throughout the day. If it's an animation YouTuber who does nothing but animations, you know, to as a career, then they'd likely be dedicating a good eight hours a day doing it. Um, the more you do it, you start developing techniques, you start developing your own shortcuts. It becomes faster and easier to figure out exactly what kind of motion you want a character to make, how to achieve that motion. It's not too, too, uh, not too, too bad once you're practiced it to it. What do you think of the saying, those that can't teach? It sort of applies to me. I can't seem to be able to land a proper, solid uh, studio job, so I'm teaching. <laughs> but in order to be able to teach, yeah, you do need to be able to do what you're teaching. Otherwise, what are you doing there, right? I'd say those who can teach... And those who can even more teach and do the extra at the same time. <laughs> Is getting into animation difficult? No, you just honestly need to have the passion for it. Uh, learning how to do it, it's not too difficult. You just need to get your hands on a program, find yourself either, you know, a place to learn, either a class, a college, or even if you're just learning by yourself bit by bit through YouTube videos or just, you know, from other sources as well, practicing or doing trial and error to figure out how things work, how things don't work. It's it's it can be difficult to master it at the end of the day, yes. Uh, but just getting into it, not at all, not at all. You just have to have a lot of passion and the drive to really improve yourself, to really push yourself to, uh, you know, to become um, skillful. I guess it's. It sounds by your voice that even you, every project you've ever done, you've been very passionate about. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's because I enjoy, you know, when you do something you enjoy, right? 
It's just, it's not, you don't think of it like, oh man, okay, today I got, what do I have to do today? Right, right, okay, today, oh, I got to animate this character climbing up a wall and doing a backflip. Oh, no, no, nonsense. You wake up in the morning, you're like, I got to make this guy climb a wall and then do a backflip? Hell yeah, let's figure this out. Okay, the hand kind of goes here, so uh, should it take, okay, it'll probably take like maybe about half a second for the hand to reach up here and to, okay, I got to think about how the hand claws in and out. Like, it's, it's, uh, it's a fun thing. <laughs> so yes, uh, as long as you enjoy what you're doing, it's, uh, it's easy to be passionate about it. It's easy to just really get into, uh, into what you're doing. Like, what are the main different types of animation out there? Mm, you got quite a lot of them, my goodness. Uh, easiest, uh, easiest first two to answer would be 2D animation, but even then, just 2D animation has so many sub-genres. There's 3D animation as well. There's stop-motion animation that you can do as well. Um, in terms of 2D animation, of course, you got your hand-drawn animation, your more classic animation, where you literally draw by hand, frame by frame, one piece of paper per frame, <laughs> all of the different uh, all the different minute poses that a character goes through. I've done it before. Oh, I never want to do it again. It is a pain in the ass to do. <laughs> um, you can, of course, do 2D computer animation as well. That's not as bad. You got your tweening. You got your... Uh, one program I'm familiar with is Toon Boom, which does allow you to kind of do little flash animations almost. Um, in terms of 3D animation, of course, you got your 3D modeling software. Once you have your model, it's just a question of saying, okay, frame zero, you're here. And by frame 30, so... Uh, well, let's say you're doing 60 frames per second. So by frame 60, uh, you know, your hand's over here. So it's just a question of taking taking a, a snapshot, let's say at frame zero here, snapshot at frame 60 here, and then figuring out the in-betweens to really get the just the right the right motion you want, you know? You mentioned flash animation. Why does flash animation always look so janky? <laughs> because it is janky. <laughs> Simplest way of putting it, the uh, the tools for it. If you're skilled at you know digital art and stuff like that, the tools for it, you can work your way around it and definitely make it look really really good. However, for the most part, people who do get into flash animation may not be professional. They might be a little more you know casual amateur, just getting into it sort of thing. So it's very easy to just kind of build a puppet that has little joints and you just move those little joints in your 2D shapes. And that does tend to look a little bit jankier, but if it works, it works, right? As long as the uh the story's fun or whatever you're watching is fun. Whatever. <laughs> From conversations with you and the animation that you did for me you do mostly 3d animation correct correct yes as i mentioned before i have done 2d animation previously in uh in college it's way too much work though i'm <laughs> never want to touch that again uh but as soon as i tried out 3d animation for the first time in college that i just immediately know okay yes this is what i want to do because you already have your armature you have your characters or whatever you want already built and it's it's a lot easier to work with. It's a lot uh, there's a lot of technical stuff that goes into it, but it's a lot easier to just kind of slowly work your way through until you get exactly what you want without the headache of having to redraw literally thousands of uh, pages worth of frames or what have you just to get the right you know, the right thing you're looking for. Oof. Uh, but usually I also do teach level design, showing people how to take the 3D models they built and bring them into a 3D world for gameplay and stuff like that. Is that 40k miniatures behind you? No, those are little D&D &D miniatures that I've uh, recently gotten gotten into painting, hoping to hoping to get good enough at doing it so that I can start actually doing commissions and stuff like that to, to paint other people's miniatures should they want to. But I have, uh, I don't know, I'll grab a couple examples. Why not? Oh, there we go. So I'm not going to touch that one. I was still kind of drying up. Uh, I just recently varnished it. It's still drying up, but uh, I do have... It's not really going to... My camera sucks. It's not going to zoom in or anything like that. It's going to be hard to see the finer details, but it's just little, little characters I've done. How would one take a D&D &D miniature and make it into a 3D model? Well, ideally... You'd want to take uh, several snapshots of, of the uh, miniature, so preferably front, the back, top, sides. 
So you kind of get an idea of your proportions, get an idea of your shapes and stuff like that that you want to work with. Uh, from there, you can actually bring the images directly into your 3D modeling program, set them up to the right scale. That way, as you build your pieces, you kind of break down your different shapes into base primitives. So for example, this wolf here, the torso, I probably start off with a box, maybe have some cylinders for the arms, that sort of idea, right? And you just very slowly but surely shape your box and cylinders into the musculature, into you know, whatever body shape you need, weld it all together, until eventually you've, uh, you got what you want. For finer details, you can bring it into a sculpting program like ZBrush or Mudbox, increase the, uh, <laughs> completely up-res uh, up the model to millions of polygons, and from there you can literally just sculpt tiny hairs and you know, wrinkles and all sorts of fun things, which you from there could uh, 3D print if you needed to. Not, not that you should do that and, uh, you know, <laughs> well, if you do it, just don't, co don't, don't copy other uh, people's work, obviously. <laughs> if you make your own miniatures, that's totally fine. That makes a lot more sense, taking a 2D picture and making it 3D while it's a lot, a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. As long as he's got, as long as you got the right kind of pictures, right? As long as you got your flat side views, front views, top views, known as a model sheet. As long as you have that, it becomes much, much easier because then you really can just, you know, use that to base a uh, you know, to work your proportions and shapes and stuff like that. It's a great starting point, and then from there you can look at your three D model from a more completed shape and finagle it to uh, until it's something you're happy with. That is, that is good to know. It, what are some of the things that even the professionals find hard with 3D animation? Hmm. That's a difficult question to answer. It honestly really does depend on the individual professional, on the individual himself. Uh, generally, be honestly, it'd be anything new, anything, any kind of animation or effect you haven't done yet would be difficult. But then all it, all that means is you find a way to do it. You apply yourself to discover a you know some fashion, some method of being able to achieve whatever results you want. Uh, for example, the animation I made for you, I wasn't too sure exactly to begin with again how it would get that star kind of like that star glow effect going in properly. Until then, I figured, oh yeah, 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 I could just do the you know bright emissive texture. That's how you make something glow. Just apply a bit of a mask over it. Ended up pretty nicely. Or getting the uh, little trail particle effect working the way I wanted it to. That was, a, that was a bit of a pain too, but felt difficult to do. But because it was something a little bit new to me, but I was able to solve it, to find a way to do it, work my way through it. And now if I have to do it again, well, I know how to do it. It's going to be easy, right? So that makes me wonder, can you watch a movie and... I can you watch an animated movie or animated TV show without critiquing it? No. <laughs> that just cannot happen. It's gotten to the point, honestly, where I can't even look at an object without thinking to myself, oh, yeah, 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 okay, to model it, you would do this, 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 this. Like You can almost see the 3D mesh on these things. You know, for example, looking at, let's say, my little water bottle here, thinking back to my previous example for this little figurine of breaking it down to a smaller, more basic shape. Well, I'm going to ask you, actually, what basic shape could you start with to make a bottle? Sorry, I was muted. A cylinder? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. A cylinder. So then you're looking like to other people, they see this and they see like, oh, yeah, it's a bottle that holds, you know, drinks, water, whatever. I see this. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's a cylinder with like an edit poly modifier on it, possibly. And maybe it's been squeezed a little bit more at the top, tapered a little bit. Or alternatively, I could use a lathe modifier to just kind of build it all very, very... It's, uh, it never ends. <laughs> it makes looking at things and looking at movies very, uh, very, very different, for sure. You can still enjoy animated movies, though, right? Oh, certainly. Certainly, yes. Certainly, certainly. If anything, it's a, it's a lot more fun when you see special effects or you do see you know CGI or 3D model and you think to yourself... Wait, hang on, how do they do that? <laughs> or, you know, you're just looking at you like, yo, that's really well done. Whoa. Right? It's fun. Uh, it's fun like that. Does that, does, 
Does that mean that you can tell the difference between practical effect and CGI? Not if it's done very, very well. Um, poor CGI does definitely pop out a lot more <laughs> than me, for sure. But uh, if it's done very, very well, sometimes I can't tell. Have any of your students got into any of the big games? Yes. Studios or big movie studios or anything like that? Big movie studios, possibly. I don't really follow too closely what my uh, exactly what it is my students do. Uh, but every year we do kind of do a little bit of an expo, I guess you could say, uh, with Ubisoft, where we send our students to Montreal. They show what they've been doing to Ubisoft itself. And yes, we have had students be hired by Ubisoft and other, other, a lot of other gaming companies are around Canada as well. Are you happy that you're teaching animation and not video game design? Yes, I'm absolutely happy to be teaching uh, animation, 3D modeling. And through level design, I do actually teach a little bit of game design. Because in terms of teaching level design, of course, it's important for students to know, to learn how to design a world that uh, that that's intuitive for a player to go through right it's not just uh you're not just randomly throwing objects everywhere everything needs to serve a purpose a room is designed you know in a purposeful way light serves a purpose you use it to guide your player you use it to you know make certain areas more interesting uh got to learn how to properly build an area to teach the player as well creating skill gates so you know the player finds a new ability so you're going to build the next area in such a way that gets the player to use this new ability to teach them how to use it and so on and so forth as well. So there is some game design uh, that I do teach at the same time. And how you describe skill gates, I can't help but think of all the Zelda games I've ever played. That's a perfect example. Yes, Zelda games are fantastic for using skill gates. It's always a it's does what it needs to do you get a you know link finds a new tool finds a new item it's like oh yay the hook shot how does it work what does it do well how do i get out of this room i gotta use the hook shot okay that's simple as simple as that really yeah well i want to thank my viewers for making it to the end of the video i'd like to thank eric for letting me talk at him for however long this video turns out to be. <laughs> I'm sure your viewers will agree. It was not long enough. We want more Fajouk. <laughs>